Good morning. I'm Pastor Rebecca, and I welcome each of you to Community United Methodist Church. Uh, today, which in the United Methodist Church we call Human Relations Sunday, and uh, it, this Sunday always takes place the day before Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And so it is a day for us to especially think about the kind of justice we are called to do, the kind of justice that Jesus calls us to do in this world. I'll invite Adam to please come forward to open us in prayer. Let us pray. Holy One, open us to the presence of your spirit Move us to respond to Jesus' invitation to follow him. Give us the words to invite others to come and see that greater things are possible when we cross boundaries. Build trust and share our abundance through the, your church. Amen. Amen. Please stand and join me in the call to worship. God has set free our feet on solid rock and made our steps secure. With divine security, we step forward to be part of restoring the beloved community. God has given us a new song to sing. In praise we declare that freedom reign. God has multiplied wonderful deeds for us. God is generous with steadfast love and faithfulness. We can't help but share the abundance we have been given. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing and join me in singing hymn number 697, America, <clears throat> My Country, Tis of Thee. Please join me in our prayer of confession. Faithful God, you call us to be your servants, but we worry that we lack the skills to do your work. You put a new song of praise in our mouths, but we stumble on unfamiliar words. Put your song on our lips and in our hearts and remind us of the joy that awaits us when we put our trust in you. Amen. God is faithful and ever-present. The God who knew us before our birth loves us still 
and strengthens us. Through the gift of Jesus Christ, God offers forgiveness, grace, and mercy. Amen. I invite the children and youth to come forward for our children's message. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> uh, so, do you know why you don't have school tomorrow? What do we celebrate tomorrow? Mm -hmm. Yep, I heard some kids saying it. Martin Luther King Jr. Day. That's right. And have you been learning about Martin Luther King Jr. in school? Yeah? Yeah? Usually you do beforehand, yeah. Um, but have you been learning about anyone else? Um, well, what is Martin Luther King Jr. known for? What are the, some of the things that he's known for? Will? He, uh, Will said he's known for uh, black people's rights, fighting for the rights of black people. That's right. Alex? He's known for the I Have a Dream speech yeah, and has a lot of famous speeches and, um, and writings, but that is definitely the most famous one, right? Yes. Known for marches? Yes, for doing uh, different kinds of marches and protests. And uh, one thing, I'll see if there's any other things you want to mention. Oh, Alex, did you have another one? Mm -hmm. Right. So a lot of he said a lot of the methods, a lot of the things, way he, ways he did protests and so forth, um, he got ideas from Gandhi, and they were nonviolent methods. Right. So the idea that is one of the things that he's known for is uh, leading nonviolent ways of protesting and making change, and uh, really, uh, really was effective. Um, there, there was you know, bus boycott. Um, different marches, sit-ins, different things like that that the people were doing. Uh, so, but one thing that I just wanted to mention is, of course we know that it's great to learn about Martin Luther King Jr. He was a really important leader of the civil rights movement, but there were also a lot of other people who, um, who worked for civil rights. Were, and um, I have this book called Icons of the Civil Rights Movement that just has a few of the other people. And so I just wanted to talk about um, a few other people, and um, Atlas, can you just change the slide? So I'll try to show you this. This is a picture of three women, and you can see up on the screen as well. I'm going to tell you their names and a little bit about each one. And the idea is just to remember that there are so many people, so many people who have worked for justice, for racial justice and, and other kinds of civil rights in the past, even before Martin Luther King Jr. and even on through today. There are still lots of people um, who are working for justice. So let me just tell you, uh, one of these ladies is named Septima Clark. She was born May 3rd in 1898 in Charleston, South Carolina. And it says she was the daughter of a father who had been a slave and a mother who was raised in Haiti. And one of the things it talks about with her is that she was a teacher she earned a bachelor's degree from Columbia and a master's degree from Hampton Institute. That in itself is amazing at that time for a woman and then especially an African-American woman is really amazing. And she really tried to work against racial discrimination and tried to get, um, get people, especially um, black people, to be able to vote because that's a really important way of being able to make change is to be able to participate in voting. And a lot of times, um, 
there have been different ways that black people have, that people have tried to deny them the ability to vote. Um, another person here is named Dorothy Height. She was born March 24th, 1912, raised in the steel mill area of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. In 1932, she graduated from NYU with a master's degree in educational psychology. And she worked for the welfare department in New York City. Um, and she worked on something that sounds really interesting. In the 1960s, she organized Wednesdays in Mississippi. So she was in New York and she brought together black and white women from the North and the South and um, tried to get them to be in conversation. And, and even the First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, Presidents Eisenhower and Johnson, all of them looked for her um, input and tried to get advice from her about interracial issues. So she really did a lot. And have you ever heard the name Dorothy Height? You, have you heard? Yeah? I, I personally had not heard her name, but like she did a lot of amazing things. And the last person I'll mention um, is named Ella Baker. And she's the last picture up there. Born on December 13, 1903, she grew up in rural North Carolina, where she heard stories from the past from, from her grandmother who had been a slave. She became valedictorian of Shaw University in 1927, and she moved to New York, New York City. And uh, one thing it says about her is she was the driving force in the creation of the Student Nonviolent Committee and coordinator of the Freedom Rides in 1961. So working on desegregation, trying to, to stop um, people being separated by race. So she did a lot of amazing things too, and I'm sure there's a lot more to be said about those three ladies. But just remember that it's, it's great, we should learn about Martin Luther King Jr. and everything that he did, but we can also learn about so many other people and remember that you also are an important person who can do your own work on justice. And who knows, who knows what you can do but even in small ways, you can, um, you can work to uh, make people more equal and treated more fairly. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for the wonderful examples that we have of so many people like Martin Luther King Jr. and um, these women that we learned about today. Uh, we thank you for all of their work, their tireless work and sometimes dangerous work to try to work for justice and racial equality. And we, we thank you that we also have been given our own gifts, that we can work to make the world a better place. And we pray that you would strengthen us and help us to do that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So there's Sunday school for the younger ones, but no Sunday school, Alex, for the middle school. The scripture reading is taken from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 24, verses 17 through 22. You shall not deprive a resident alien or an orphan of justice. You shall not take a widow's garment in pledge. Remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. Therefore, I command you to do this. When you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be left for the alien, the orphan, and the widow, so that the Lord your God may bless you in all your undertakings. When you beat your olive trees, do not strip what is left. It shall be for the alien, the orphan, and the widow. When you gather the grapes of your vineyards, do not glean what is left. It shall be for the alien, the orphan, and the widow. 
Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I am commanding you to do this. This is the word of God for the people of God. share with you a video of special music, uh, which most of you have um, seen and, and heard before. This is a recording from uh, 2019. And so it's a, it's a little bit shaky. I took it with, with my iPhone at that time. I didn't have a, a tripod. Um, but uh, this is a, a wonderful composition of We Shall Overcome and Blackbird, performed by Dave Shrewsbury, Matt Turrell, and Kim LeBlanc. I am human because you are human. My humanity is caught up in yours, and if you are dehumanized, I am dehumanized. These words were spoken by Archbishop Desmond Tutu as he spoke about the evil of apartheid in South Africa. 
I find those words to have a similar meaning to the words of Martin Luther King Jr. who said in his letter from Birmingham jail, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Whenever we witness injustice taking place, whenever one group of people is being dehumanized, all of us are called to stand up against it. Regardless of who is bearing the brunt of that particular injustice, we should feel that our humanity is caught up with the humanity of others. In the scripture passage from Deuteronomy, there are three specific categories of people lifted up, foreigners, orphans, and widows. It's not an exclusive list, but rather a list that represents groups of people who have often experienced injustice. God commanded the Jewish people to treat the foreigners, orphans, and widows with justice, and God gives them two reasons to do so. One is simply that God is commanding it, and of course that should be enough. But God offers a second reason, repeated twice in this passage. People are meant to remember that they were slaves in Egypt and that God had redeemed them from slavery. Now, I imagine that the first generation of people, um, those people who actually were slaves in Egypt and had escaped, that these words had a particular impact for them. They could themselves remember the brutal treatment, the forced labor, the complete lack of freedom and uh, over decisions and just over their own lives. They knew what it was like to be a slave, to be completely deprived of justice, and they knew that God had saved them. So it could be easy for them to understand why they should treat foreigners, orphans, widows, and other people with justice. Yet these words weren't only given to those, that first generation of people who were actually enslaved in Egypt. The words were repeated for generations that followed, future generations who had never set foot in Egypt and could not personally relate to the story of slavery or exile. However, the fact that a person, the fact that we might not have personally been slaves in Egypt or in this land is not meant to be essential in understanding the point. More important is a recognition of our common humanity with one another. We do not have to have been slaves ourselves in order to imagine how terrible it must have been and to be able to condemn slavery and other forms of injustice. One of Martin Luther King Jr.'s famous writings is his letter from Birmingham jail, written in 1963 to a group of white clergymen, a couple of Methodist pastors included in that. Those clergymen were, generally speaking, on the side of racial justice, on the side of desegregation. But they had some complaints about how Dr. King and others were doing things. Among their complaints or concerns was that the demonstrations being held against segregation were unlawful and that it would be preferable to accomplish justice through negotiation. King responded, you deplore the demonstrations taking place in Birmingham, but your statement, I'm sorry to say, fails to express a similar concern for the conditions that brought about those demonstrations. He goes on to explain that negotiation was certainly the first thing that the black community attempted, but since it was not successful, could not be successful, they were forced to turn to nonviolent direct action, like protests and sit-ins. King admits in his letter that he had hoped that the white moderate would be a better ally, but he had been bitterly disappointed. He writes, I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's greatest, great stumbling block in his stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klanner, but the white moderate, who is more devoted to order than to justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I cannot agree with your methods of direct action, who paternalistically believes that he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, 
who lives by a mythical concept of time and who constantly advises the Negro to wait for a more convenient season. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. What seemed to be lacking in this so-called moderate white community, especially among these clergy leaders, was a real understanding of the plight of black people in Alabama and elsewhere. Perhaps, he writes, it is easy for those who have never felt the, sting, the stinging darts of segregation to say, wait. Then King tried to give some examples of what black people were really experiencing. Bombings of their homes and churches, especially in that area of Alabama. Hate-filled policemen curse, kick, and even kill your black brothers and sisters. Suffocating poverty. Being called the N-word like it's your name. Having to sleep in your car while traveling because you can't get a room in a motel. Or he wrote, when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park that has just been advertised on television and see ominous clouds of inferiority beginning to form in her little mental sky. The white clergy to whom he was writing that letter from Birmingham jail thought they were on the same side as King and those seeking justice for black people they weren't against social progress, but they opposed the methods being used and the timing. Unfortunately, what this really ended up amounting to is that they weren't really on the side of the oppressed. Deuteronomy talks about justice for the foreigner, orphan, and widow, but it could just as well speak for any group of marginalized or oppressed people who deserve justice. All of us are called to have a special concern for any groups who are being oppressed, who are being denied justice, and to seek justice for them, with them. If we believe that our humanity is tied up together, we will do just that. And we will listen closely if a group of people tries to tell us that they are experiencing injustice and oppression, and not be quick to dismiss them, deny them, or find ourselves defending the wrong people. As I said last week, we have to examine ourselves to see, really see what privileges we are carrying around with us and to recognize, as King wrote, lamentably, it is an historical fact that privileged groups seldom give up their privileges voluntarily. It seems kind of unfortunate in, in a way that Dr. King's words from 60 years ago still sound so relevant to us today. Great progress has been made in the way of racial equality, but we still have a long way to go before we can truly say that there is racial justice. Racism is, is still alive throughout the world, throughout this country, and even including our own area. Now, we are not worse than anyone else, but we're not uniquely unprejudiced here in Wayland and the surrounding towns. The recent graffiti that was found on the side of the community pool helps to highlight that fact. The graffiti consisted of two words written largely, Omar, the first name of our superintendent of schools, Dr. Omar Easy, an equals sign, and the N-word. Not only was Dr. Easy affected by this terrible, blatant racism, along with his family, but so were all of the students and the teachers, all of the people of this community, but especially the black students both those who live in Wayland, as well as those who are part of the METCO program and live in Boston but attend school in Wayland. It was such an obvious and visible manifestation of racism and hatred, and it was extremely upsetting. There were all, all kinds of responses after this happen, happened. Uh, many, many uh, responses of um, 
support for the superintendent. He talked about in a school committee meeting how he was inundated with, with so many messages of kindness and support in that time. One of the kinds of responses that, um, that, was, that we heard uh, people saying and that, that appeared on social media is a kind of response of, this is not Wayland. This is not who we are. Some people responded to these statements with an appeal for people to reflect a little bit more on those statements. Some people, especially people of color, urged white people to recognize that while this might be a, a blatant display of racism, this graffiti, much like a blatant display um, that appeared inside the middle school the year before, although these might, not, um, might only happen once in a while, there are countless instances of racism some of it subtle, some of it not so subtle, that people of color experience in Wayland. One of my daughters came home telling me once about uh, something that happened in fourth grade where, where one student was pushed by another and called the N-word. And I was shocked and upset to hear that. But it was, although not a common experience, not an isolated incident, either. Another time, um, one student who was in the METCO program, so who lives in Boston, she was working on something in class and was complaining that it was really hard. And another student made a comment to her, that's because you're from Boston. I could explain a little bit more about that, and I think there was just, you know, a level of ignorance that was happening in, in that statement um, that the student herself might not have even understood what she was really saying and how hurtful it could be. But these kinds of things do happen and I'm sure you could speak to um, hear from any person of color um, different microaggressions and things that they experience in this community. As I said, this community is, is not worse than other places, but we shouldn't think that we are just completely unique and unprejudiced. So I mentioned uh, last week that the graffiti came after another situation developing with Dr. Easy. So the original um, situation was that, um, and there might be more to it, um, but there was a, a meeting with teachers that he was leading, and uh, he talked about how he was seeing what he categorize, categorized as bullying among some of the teachers and was trying to address that situation. Now, this particular meeting, we don't have a recording of the meeting. We only have reports from other people, so I can only speak so much about, about that meeting. But there were a lot of um, comments from people afterwards, so uh, one or more teachers was um, reporting that as Dr. Easy talked very forcefully about what he saw as bullying, um, that um, people felt, felt even bullied by him by his tone. Uh, so it ended up coming before the school board and Dr. Easy's character was publicly being discussed and sometimes attacked in that forum. And there was a, a November meeting, um, which I, most of which I, I watched online, um, and there were you know, all different opinions, but there were some people who at that time were warning um, for people to be cautious about um, how they were talking about Dr. Easy. You know, so if there is some kind of actual complaint to be made, that's one thing. But to be thoughtful and conscious of what exactly they are saying about him. And especially something like talking about the tone um, of a black man uh, can be a coded way of referring to race. So there's more to that story, but whether intentional or unintentional, consciously or, or unconsciously, we have to ask ourselves if it is possible that Dr. Easy ended up being investigated by the school committee in a way that, um, that 
people said had, had not happened before with any other superintendent, could it have anything to do with the color of his skin? And then with the racist graffiti appearing on the wall a month later, December 21st, we have to ask ourselves whether a line can be drawn between the particular way that Dr. Easy was being challenged and treated and the fact that someone felt emboldened to put that on the wall. When we think about that graffiti and we picture all of the children and adults who were hurt and traumatized by it, do we feel that our humanity is tied up with all of the people who felt hurt? Do we feel ready to say, not this isn't Wayland, but instead, this is not what we want Wayland to be, or Wayland must do better. Um, the, some of the students are selling these bracelets that I've, I've got one on that says, Wayland must do better. Um, they're selling them and trying to raise money for more anti-racism training throughout the district. Um, th is that what we need to say? Not, not um, brushing anything under the rug or um, getting defensive and saying, this isn't, this isn't Wayland, but instead saying, we can do better. Wayland must do better. It's already a great place, but it can do better. We may or may not be part of an oppressed group of people. We may or may not be foreigners, orphans, widows, black people, brown people, LGBTQ plus people. But we do not need to be directly part of a group of people in order to attempt to understand them and to listen to others when they cry out for justice and not to automatically dismiss what they are saying or attempt to defend their oppressor because we must do better. God calls us to do better and to seek justice, not for some, but for all people. Amen. I'd like to invite you to sing with me our hymn, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. Uh, we sing this knowing that it was the favorite hymn, favorite hymn of Martin Luther King Jr. And we have a video to play for this, but please stand if you're able. Oh, 
my hand, take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. Please be seated. It's time for us to share our joys and concerns with one another. Uh, I'll lift up one concern that was mentioned to me this morning, which is prayers for Helen Barber, um, who I I guess this was a while ago, um, perhaps even close to a month ago, that she fell and was in the hospital. Um, But she is home and recovering, but we pray for her continued healing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Yesterday, I was privileged to join in the celebration of life for Donna Morrill, who used to attend here when we were growing up. And she was part of a group of four girls, Debbie Henry, Donna Henry, herself, and Claire Prince. Prayers for Claire, she's the last of the four left. Um, and as women get older, or well, as people get older, I should say, and your kind of circle of friends is gone, you need a little more support and help. Um, also, I found out yesterday, and I did not know that Donna Henry had passed away last summer, and a great joy, and I may even cry, one of my old daycare kids who was born at one and a half pounds became a dad last night. Oh, wow. To just over five pound boy, <laughs> Jameson Russell. So I am so over the moon for this boy that you cannot imagine. Thank you. We lift up the, that joy and those concerns. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Um, My mom is back in the hospital. She has another fracture in her back, on her spine. It's higher up than the one before. Um, I guess she had been saying she can't get in and out of bed, so my brother Chris brought her over yesterday, and they just did a CAT scan and pictures of her lungs and everything, and that's where they found the other fracture. So um, just prayers for my mom. Um, there, I don't know how long she's going to be in the hospital, and more than likely it'll be rehab afterwards, but um, it's, it's just a lot, so um, I just lift up my mom. Thank you. What's, what's your mom's name? Um, Barbara. So, sorry, say it again. Barbara. Barbara? Okay, sorry. Just the mask. <laughs> we lift up Barbara in our prayers for her healing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Oh. oh, okay. Uh, MLK Human Relations Sunday is uh, one of the more meaningful Sundays for me on my church calendar. Uh, as you know, uh, this church has a, has a tradition uh, that goes back because of the connection that we had. Uh, many of you know the story that uh, Coretta Scott sat in the back three rows on my left side when she was attending school in BU. Uh, and what people don't know is the other story about Larry Nielsen's connection to Martin Luther King. And when you have stories that are that connected, I think about this whole idea of two degrees of freedom, how close we are to people who were so important. Uh, Most of you know Larry, but for those of you who haven't met him, he was a very uh, important leader in our church for about 30 years. Uh, He moved away to the state of Washington about 15 years ago, uh, and he was beloved by all who knew him. He was a science teacher, at the middle school right up the road. And it was uh, in one of his early years of teaching that he went to a teacher's science convention in Washington, DC. 
And while he was there that weekend, they didn't have any uh, sessions on the Sunday, he decided to go to the National Washington Cathedral. Now in those days, you didn't have cell phones, so he didn't know who was speaking. But when he gets there, he learns that Martin Luther King is the guest preacher for that Sunday. So you can imagine when he walks in and he gets to hear this sermon. Uh, he was touched, uh, it, it meant a lot to him, but then it became even more important because that Sunday, that message that he heard was considered Martin Luther King's last Sunday sermon. Now the reason that's important is because the second degree of freedom, people like Martin Luther King talk about dreams that they have and the way that we should look at society and what we need to do to improve. And when those people leave, it behooves the people who are left to, to give that message out. That was the last time he gave that message. Martin Luther King was assassinated four days later. I'd like to share with you a prayer that was written by Martin Luther King Jr. Let us be in prayer. O thou eternal God, out of whose absolute power and infinite intelligence the whole universe has come into being, we humbly confess that we have not loved thee with our hearts, souls, and minds, and we have not loved our neighbors as Christ loved us. We have too often lived by our own selfish impulses rather than by the life of sacrificial love as revealed in Christ. We often give in order to receive. We love our friends and hate our enemies. We go, to the, we go the first mile but dare not travel the second. We forgive but dare not forget. And so as we look within ourselves, we are confronted with the appalling fact that the history of our lives is the history of an eternal revolt against thee. But thou, O oh God, have mercy upon us. Forgive us for what we, what we could have been but failed to be. Give us the intelligence to know thy will. Give us the courage to do thy will. Give us the devotion to love thy will. In the name and spirit of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And let us continue to pray as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, as we forgive our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, um, be, before um, Paula does the invitation to the offering, I want to share with you um, a two-minute video on Human Relations Day. So there are some pew cards, like some information, as well as some envelopes at the both at the front and the back of the sanctuary for a special collection for this Human Relations Day. And this video is an attempt to explain um, a little bit about that. Everyone loves a hero because, in the face of injustice, a hero stands up. For the frustrated and voiceless, a hero speaks up. When God's children were oppressed, a hero set the captives free. And now through your connection with the United Methodist Church, you can follow his example. You can be a hero too. Your generous gift to the Human Relations Day special offering empowers a host of humble heroes who believe everyone has the right to realize their potential as human beings in relationship with one another. Through this special offering of the United Methodist Church, generally celebrated in January and the Sunday before the national observance of Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday, you offer a lasting solution. You bring permanent justice through systemic change and community development. You bring wholeness and economic opportunity to strengthen those who have no hope. 
The majority of this special offering benefits neighborhood ministries through community developers, empowering those closest to the need to do the most good. A significant portion supports community advocacy through United Methodist Voluntary Services, raising awareness of problems like poverty and homelessness, human trafficking, immigration, and environmental justice. Your giving gives hope to at-risk teens through ministries like the Youth Offender Rehabilitation Program, positioning young men and women for success as they find their way forward once again. When you give to the Human Relations Day offering, you become a humble hero, affirming that every one of God's children deserves justice, equality, and the opportunity to walk freely in the light of God's love. And you empower each of them to someday become heroes too. Together, we do more. Learn more about Human Relations Day. Visit www.umcgiving.org forward slash HRD. We are reminded in 1 Peter 4, 10, that all that we have, all that we are, and all that we have potential to be are God's gift to us by grace. And that these gifts are given to us so that we in turn may share them with others. From scripture, as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Our offering plates are at the front of the church or in the back. Online giving can be assessed on the church website. Won't you stand if you are able for the doxology? God, your wondrous deeds are more than can be counted. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for the resources you send us to free us from the sin of racism and other injustices. Receive these gifts from us as they join with gifts from other United Methodists. Multiply and transform them into your vision of a restored community. Amen. Please be seated. Announcements. <clears throat> Stewardship and finance meeting will meet today at 11.30. In Fellowship Hall on Thursday at 6 p.m., is a light exercise and time of meditation called Body and Soul. If you're interested, please uh, check in with Rebecca. Are there other announcements? Got, got a couple to share. Um, well, first, um, I missed uh, Joy that was mentioned online that Christine had, had put up saying that she got a new part-time job with an affordable, ho affordable housing group. Um, so congratulations to Christine and blessings um, on that new job. Um, this uh, is an open house for the Family Promise. Um, it says that you can come and tour the, um, the on-site shelter and the date is January 19th from 4 to 630 6 Mulligan Street in Natick and it's also an opportunity to meet the new executive director. Um, so all are welcome to that. And, oh, I thought I had another one on there, but... It, oh, um, 
So I just also wanted to mention that on, and I put this in the weekly email, that on June, uh, January 29th, we are going to have a, a new kind of special service, which is a celebration of Community UMC in 2022. Um, so just an opportunity to think about the past year and what we really um, appreciated and uh, what, what special memories we might have. So I need your help for that. I've, I've gotten email, uh, an e some emails from just maybe one person so far. Um, and if you are a person who would either like to, you know, just uh, send a picture or send a kind of memory that you have, if you're willing to actually say it out loud on that Sunday, we'll have an open time for people to, to share, or you can let me know ahead of time so that you can share that. Otherwise, I can read it. So just think about, like, what, what do you really remember about 2022 in this church? What was really special? And let's um, take some time to celebrate that. Were there any other announcements? Lift up. All right, if not, then let's join together in singing We Are Called, number 2172 in The Faith We Sing, and the words will be on the screen. Please stand if you're able. to go forth from this place, ready to seek justice for all people and not just some. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Sons of former slaves and of sons of 
former slave owner, will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood? I have a dream. into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. Come true. So let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the curvaceous slopes of California. But not only that, let freedom ring from the stone mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill 